Hi, I'm Dr. Turlip, and I wanted to talk to you today about an important thing. Viruses. In particular, computer viruses. In fact, this video that you just downloaded is a computer virus that you just installed onto your machine. Good job, dummy. All right, everyone. It is lecture 20. It means you've made it through effectively, unless you... Are cheating and watching this video ahead of time and didn't watch the other ones, you've made it through four full weeks with me. As I suspect probably about six of you are left. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, man. It's a, it's been a long, uh, it's, it's been, a, it's been a long time. feels like a long time for me, even though we're just now getting into week two in, in reality at the time of recording this, but, uh, whew, it's been a lot of lectures. So congrats. Um, I know all of you are thinking to yourselves at this point, I can't believe it's over halfway over. And uh, it is. But uh, you say, are, how are we ever going to learn anything ever again without you? you you'll, you'll be okay, I promise. But, you know, you may be asking yourself too, is there anything we can do for you? You know, that since you've made our lives so great and so wonderful. Um, actually, all I want is to be famous on the Purdue subreddit. That's, that's my only goal in life. <laughs> uh, no, I got to get that PhD. But uh, it's been fun. Uh, I probably won't teach again while I'm here at Purdue, but you never know. I may. We'll see. You may see me in the future, but I, I doubt it unless you have to retake this class, and that, in, in which case it'll be a little awkward. Um, <laughs> but anyways, so today what we're going to do in celebration of, of lecture 20, is talk about initial conditions with the Laplace. And actually, this is really a, it's, it's kind of the denouement. Like, we're, we're on the descent now for the rest of the course um, into the frequency domain. Uh, we're getting really into that, um, into the implications of the Laplace transform now. Um, so today what we're going to do is look at this little funky thing and see what it does for us in terms of our capacitors and inductors, which are our time-based or time-dependent uh, systems. They're reactive systems. That's what a reactive system means. So, oh boy, here I go RLCing again. Um, yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to do the same thing we've done before a lot, um, but you're going to like it. I mean, it's kind of dark, but, you know, yeah, we'll make it through together, guys. It does get more interesting, I promise. As soon as we start talking about uh, our graphs in the frequency domain, everything will really start to make sense. Okay, so we're back to this example. Here we go again. Oh, boy. Let's suppose that we, this time, though, have an initial condition. So you may recall that for this uh, RC circuit, RC circuit, we have a forcing function here, which is our input, right? We said that this was now more of an input for us. And we've now added, which we've done in the past, uh, an initial condition. So we write out our differential equation, and then we plug in our stuff. And what we want from here is to solve for the homogeneous and particular solution. Since that's not the focus today, we're going to go ahead and assume that we did lots of things to get there. And this is what we end up with, is this equation. We use and apply our initial conditions. And when we do that, we get some kind of um, effect on this parameter, A, right? Now, for more complicated circuits, obviously, this becomes more complicated, and we've seen how uh, difficult this can become and cumbersome. So, again, we're going to turn towards Laplace to see what we can do to solve this. Okay? So, let's do the time warp again, right? <laughs> um, if you haven't seen Rocky Horror Picture Show, which I suspect you probably haven't, um, you can go ask your film friends. Um, you... You, you probably don't have film friends, so actually, step one, get film friends. And then watch it. Um, oh, wait. You're electrical engineers. Let's start with this. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. We, no, none of us have any friends. It's true, though. Okay. Um, some of us have a couple, I guess. But anyways, you know, I'm, I'm not here to like get on a, get on a podium or anything about, um, political or, or, um, societal issues or anything like that. But the, there's a large representation of, uh, some of LGBT in the video. And it's kind of interesting to watch. It's, it's a, it's a wild ride too. So anyways, it's, you know, it's a cult classic. It's one of those. So yeah, you can check it out if you want to. They usually, um, have them in October around Halloween time. They'll do a Rocky Horror Picture Show. I encourage you to go. Um, just make sure you read up on it ahead of time because there's a lot of, a lot of stuff you have to do during the the showing, and you'll you'll understand what I mean later. Um, but anyways, that's that. I have no other bullshit to talk about today. So so the rest of it is boring and downhill from here, guys. I'm sorry. All right. So if we use Laplace transform on this, I better use red. We go into the frequency domain as follows. We end up with 5 over S, and we've seen this before. 10 over, uh, well, oops, not over. 10 times S, V, C, S. Remember, the derivative just gives us that S. Minus, and we're going to keep that initial condition because it's not just trivially equal to 0. Okay, it's so very important in this case. Plus V, C, S. Okay. And from here, we plug in the initial condition, solve away, uh, we end up with um, 5s is equal to 10s, vcs, minus 20, plus vcs, apply that 10 through, 5 over s plus 20 equals vcs times, and we just factor out here, okay? Notice here we're trying to isolate VC in this process. And then finally we just divide out. We end up with VCS is equal to 5 over S times 10 S plus 1 plus 20 over 10 S plus 1. And at this point, um, we essentially have two bits that we we can work with here um and we want to simplify this a little bit further too just to get rid of some of the nastiness but uh we end up with one half over s plus a half i'm sorry over a tenth plus a, oh come on s plus a tenth and two over s plus ten okay same deal um Sorry, so as I was saying, um, this one's pretty much wrapped up and good to go for us. This one we have to do a little bit of legwork on. So we got to do some partial fractions for, for that business. Um, let's go ahead and do that just so you get a little bit of practice because, you know, we cut it short last time. Um, so might as well take the time this time around. So if I take uh, 1 half over S times S plus 10... This is equal to A over S plus B over S plus 10. And again, we're not worried about this second term. Why? Because when we have addition in the frequency domain, we know that our Laplace inverse or Laplace transform, either way you want to go, is going to distribute over each of these. And so we can do the terms separately and independently from each other, which is the whole reason, by the way, that we do the partial fractions in the first place because we end up with something that is nice and separated by a plus. We just happen to already have something in that form off to the side for us already. So nothing to worry about there. What we do to solve for A is uh, we let we multiply both sides by S and then we set it equal to zero. We solve through. We end up with, for A, it should be pretty straightforward and obvious. It's one half over one tenth when we set S equal to zero and the B falls away because we're multiplying it by S. And then for uh, this is actually equal to 5. And then for B, what we end up with is 1, oops, 1 half over S times S plus a tenth. Multiply by S plus a tenth. It's equal to A, S plus a tenth, if I can write, over S. This is going to go to 0 as S is equal to minus 1 tenth. 
evaluate this at s equals minus one tenth um, plus b s plus one tenth over s plus one tenth these cancel and we're left with one half over minus ten or minus one tenth excuse me which is equal to uh, minus five okay now your book kind of plugs in this plus two which honestly threw me for a loop as well hopefully I I edited out my my confusion um, <laughs> in uh, in solving for this too because I saw this plus two and it threw me off um, actually where that's coming from is uh, it got left in there from this business right here so you could just tack it in there because they have the same denominator right so no big deal um, so anyways we end up with the following we have 5 over s plus and I'm going to write it out this way so that you can really see it uh, right here 2 of the same kind and these we can just go ahead and combine because there's really no point in leaving them separated. They just want to be together so bad. Um, so then VCS is equal to 5 over S plus minus 3 over S plus 1 tenth. Okay. We take the inverse Laplace transform back. We're going to do that time warp again. VCT is equal to 5 minus 3 Here's our uh, shift, our frequency shift. So it's just a frequency shift now in the time domain over a tenth, all times ut. Okay? So nothing too bad here. This is all stuff we've done before. But here's the problem. This is nice and all, but this is still a pain to generate. And we'd like a better way to approach this problem in general. And what we're going to do next is actually something that's going to keep coming up for you guys as you move forward in more advanced circuit analysis, okay? And that concept is using the frequency domain to re-express the model as a um, parallel or series equivalent circuit accommodating those initial conditions. Let me explain, because that's a mouthful. Um... Let's go back to our original continuity equation relationship, right? So recall that we had this for our continuity equation for current and capacitance, right? Pretty straightforward. And then we took the Laplace transform. We keep using red for Laplace transform. I don't know. I think it's cool. It was the Rocky Horror. It's not Halloween fast enough. It's my favorite holiday, too, so I don't know why. I just love Halloween. I think it's fun to scare children. Maybe that's it. Okay, and what happens next is we simplify this out. We just apply that C on through, right? And before, what we did was we said, okay, this term, we don't care about. We just, we'll assume that the initial condition is zero. We can't do that anymore. So we gotta account for this in some way. Now, recall that when we built our new model, right, in the frequency domain, what we did was we just said, well, we'll treat this like a Z, like a resistor, or, or rather, I should say uh, uh, um, the this one is admittance, right? If we go back to our other lecture, let's see here if I can find it. These equations here. So for the capacitor, SC was equal to uh, the uh, admittance on that. Similarly here, this is the admittance or one over. But in either case, what it really boils down to is I could treat it like some kind of resistance, right? Um, so what, how do I model this? If I'm drawing a diagram, how do I draw this? How do I account for that? Do I just add it in somewhere? Well, no, not really. Cause it's got this pesky C going along for the ride. Uh, what do we do? What do we do? So actually this whole thing, this is a current and this is a current, right? So effectively what's going on here is we've split the current, 
where we split the current. And let's go ahead and draw out a hypothetical, pretend, imaginary world where this actually exists, okay? Where IC is broken up into this. And you could actually think about it, you know, a myriad of different ways, but for our purposes, this is what we're going to do. So we're going to make a new capacitor. Or I should say, I'm going to make a new model of the old capacitor, right? Here's my input. Here's my output. I have some current ICS coming in. Notice here that this is dependent on frequency, not on time. We're in the, I should say we're in the frequency domain, not that it doesn't depend on time. It still depends on time. It's just we're looking at it a little differently, right? Now, to split up this current, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two things in there in parallel, right? Because that's how I split up current normally. I'm going to build this block here, and I'm going to build another block over here, okay? In this block, I'm going to put ZC, which is something we're familiar with, right? This is just uh, ZC. You could write it any way you want, but... Um, yeah, ZC is equal to our impedance of capacitor. Okay, so it acts like a resistor effectively um, when we're looking at the current equation. So if you look at this, uh, it would be ICS, and I'm going to write this properly. ZC is equal to VCS, right? V equals V equals I R in our old frame of reference, right? In our old time domain way of thinking about things, good old Ohm's law, but in a new frequency way, uh, the new cool kids are, are writing it like this, okay? So this is effectively a resistance in the frequency domain. So what is this other part on the right-hand side? I've split this current up, right? I've split this current up between this resistor, this resistor, and something else, well, that something else just looks like a directed current. It's opposing the current flow, right, that I have coming in. And I can just write it as C times VC0. This, by the way, C VC0 this is a constant and this is a constant. So this is a constant with respect to the frequency domain. Let me say that again. This portion here is a constant with respect to the frequency domain. Because I'm plugging in a specific value of T and I'm looking at a constant C. Now this is for an idealized kind of capacitor, right? Capacitors don't, this is, this is the lie that, you know, we, we tell ourselves to, to go to sleep at night as electrical engineers for the first few years of our career. But the truth is, is that no, no capacitor, resistor, or inductor behaves ideally, right? This capacitance doesn't stay constant for all frequencies and all, um, you know, voltages and, and, uh, and currents and stuff going through it. It varies a little bit, right? And sometimes it breaks and turns into magic blue smoke. And, and that's fun and all, but for all intents and purposes, right now, this is going to be treated as constant. And I think towards the very end of the course, we'll talk about some of the non-ideal properties and what happens. And it's easier to capture that behavior, by the way, when we have this framework to think about things in. Because now we can actually approach those functions a little bit easier because we have a more detailed look at what's going on with the system at different frequencies because now we can create dependencies on frequency later on. Ah, very nice. Okay, so that's where we're going way towards the end of the course and in your future courses, truly. Um, we'll, we'll touch on it towards the end more, but, um, but yeah. Okay, so the short answer here is... Uh, the other piece of current is C V C at zero constant. Okay. And I'm going to use pink like I always do for my current. And while we're in the 
in the frequency domain. It's only wobbly. That's so bad. I'm not going to do that. That's so dumb. Okay, we'll make it straight. There we go. So our current's getting split up over these two, and it's being opposed this way. All right. Now that I'm done doing my John Madden all over the, the diagram here, uh, let's move on. So here we can write this out, because um, I haven't written it out explicitly yet, but ICS, and this is really the best way to write it. Typically, typically, not always, typically you'll write stuff when given the option with Z rather than with Y. Okay, sometimes Y is more convenient, but just like we did with resistors, you generally didn't um, write 1 over R uh, for stuff. You used R, just like as is, as resistance. And so it is with impedance. V, C at 0. Okay, this is it. Okay, and this is the model for that system. The moral of the story here is that when we redraw our system in the frequency domain, instead of putting in that capacitor, so you recall from last time, when we had the um, this thing here, we didn't really, oops, we didn't really bother changing up our block diagram at all, right? We just left a capacitor there and we're like, eh, it's got this impedance thing. Now we're actually going to take the time to do this properly and our impedances are going to be marked off by blocks, okay, these, these rectangles, effectively. So now we're going to look at the other side of things. What if I looked at this from a voltage perspective for the capacitor? Hmm. Well, as it turns out, how would I write this? Um, so if I have this equation, ICS is equal to CS VCS minus C, V, C of zero. You may be thinking to yourself, well, actually, this is all in terms of voltage anyway, so why don't I write things in terms of voltage, in terms of VC rather than the current? Like the, It's completely arbitrary that you just switched to worrying about the, the current there. Who cares? So let's do that, shall we? Um, let's go ahead and isolate. We're going to write this as, and this should be in red. Boop. And... There we are, we have VCS. We're just gonna isolate, divide both sides by CS and then move the CV, uh, CVC of zero over to uh, the other side when it's divided through, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we end up with, follow me here, ICS plus VC of zero over S. Cool. Duality of voltage and, and current, right? It's a handy property to have. Now this one's nice because the, uh, the, the impedance is right there for us. But, you know, then we also have to deal with 1 over S. Eh, who knows? Who knows what's right? What if I wanted to model this one? So last time I used kind of the, the KCL version, right? This is KCL model in frequency space. Makes sense. We were doing a little current there, so uh, I should hope it was KCL. What's the equivalent? What's the equivalent to this one? Let me write this. So... I have a voltage, it drops, it drops, right? In a KVL loop, ideally, uh, that's what we're kind of looking at. Or if we're just looking at a voltage drop over the whole thing, it's going to be the sum of those two drops that I have, or whatever it may be. Um, all right, well, that sounds more like these two things are in series with each other, actually, right? So let's write this out. We'll draw a little diagram here. V, capital V, C of S. And actually make this in blue. Movie magic. Okay. So we have incoming uh, current. ICS is coming into the system. Actually, I want to do this better. 
ICS is coming into the system. All right, I got some incoming current. I have a voltage drop. And then I have two things that occur, right? I have, the first thing that occurs is this resistance, or I shouldn't say resistance, right? Because we're in the frequency domain. It's an impedance. It's not resistance. It's impedance right there. And then I have some kind of voltage source, just like I had a current source before. I can write this as a voltage source. And that voltage source is giving me a little, a little boost here over us, right? So similarly, we have this, this model of uh, a capacitor, but in this instance, I have a series with a voltage source in it rather than a parallel with a current source in it. And the book says, uh, note that the overall voltage includes both that induced by the current passing through the capacitor uh, impedance and a step function offset associated with that initial condition. Okay, so it's important for us to account for both of these things in this circuit or in this element, I should say, because we're really just looking at a singular element in this case. So when we write this back out, we can see that we just add these two parts together to get that uh, voltage back through. Now, which model do we use? That's really the question of the day, right? Which model do we use when we're trying to build our circuit? Well, it's going to depend. You're going to have to just figure it out. Um, sometimes, you know, it'll be this one. Sometimes it'll be the other one. Uh, with practice, you'll figure out which one is the right one to use. And the context is going to tell you a lot about which one is more practical for you. So going back to our example for this one, um, what we're going to do is we're going to redraw our circuit once again. Oops. In the frequency domain. And this time, what we're going to do, we're going to incorporate it with our new model elements, okay? And impedance uh, admittance blocks. So these are almost always going to be represented by little rectangles as you move forward in your education. Okay, when you have those classic symbols, those are going to be in a in a time space. But when you start thinking about things in a frequency space, you're always going to see these handy rectangles. Um, and then usually the values will be inside those rectangles or something like that. But um, yeah, it's just nice to have. So we redraw this as follows. We have Vn of s. We know that this is 5 over s plus minus here. We redraw, redraw our impedance as a block, just 100. Our current's coming down through here, IC of S. And then for our capacitor, we have this um, model here. And which model we choose is going to make our lives easier or hard. Um, I'll just go ahead and tell you that the model to choose on this one is, in fact, 10 over S. And I'm sure some of you can come up with some clever rules for the best way to approach these systems. That's fine. Um, we have... 2 over S on this part, plus minus here. Notice that these are opposed to each other, uh, these two voltage sources. So what we end up with then is VCS is equal to the total drop here, which is V, um, whoops. Which is the VCS sorry, VZCS, plus this 2 over S business that we have over here. Okay, now in order to get this, however, um, we're going to have to do a little bit of thinking. Okay, so this is effectively just like what we would do for a system with two voltage sources and two resistors in it. It really is. It's just a simple um, 
uh, superposition problem. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to break this apart into uh, two bits. So we have VC, VZC, too many subscripts, is equal to 5 over S times 10 over S over the sum 100 plus 10 over S. Again, we're just doing some voltage division here with the source, and then we subtract off 2 over S, 10 over S over 100 plus 10 over S with the source, okay? Noting here then that the, oops, noting here then that um, this voltage source here is actually part of our capacitor. And so if we want to look at the entire uh, drop in capacitance across there, or so, excuse me, the drop in voltage across there, uh, we need to account for this as well. Okay, so we're simply doing a calculation for this and then looking at the total drop. So this is recompensating for that effectively. Okay, so now that we have an equation for V, Z, C of S, what we're going to do is simplify it, do that partial fraction expansion method, convert it back, and then finally solve for V, C. If this seems complicated, it is, but it's going to make our lives easier for initial conditions because we really didn't have another way to approach this from a component model uh, before this. So we continue. VZC of S is equal to 3S, right? Because these have some, a nice common denominator here. Um, they're really easy to work with, and they're the exact same thing, right? Just the same coefficient and everything. 10 over S over 100 plus 10 over S. If I simplify this, I multiply top and bottom by S over 100, I end up with the following. I get 3 over 10 over S times S plus 1 over 10. Noting here that my coefficients of S for my two different factors are equal to 1, right? I always try to set those equal to 1. So I end up here, if I was going to break this out, it would be A over S plus B over S plus a tenth. No surprise there. This is what we saw before, so should really come as no surprise whatsoever. Um, and then we end up with the following. We have evaluated at A. We have A is equal to 3 over 10 over 1 over 10, which equals 3. And B is going to give us, we'll just do that. And then B is going to give us 3 over 10 over minus 1 over 10 when we do the partial fraction method, which is minus 3 for B. And so combining these in, plugging them in, we get VC, VZC of S is equal to 3 over S plus, actually minus here, minus 3 over S plus 1 over 10. But recall that we wanted to get VC of S, right? So this is actually equal to this guy plus that extra S over 2. So we end up with, in fact, 5 over S minus 3 over S plus 1 over 10. And so you can see here that this actually isn't too bad. What it did was it, it added in just this little little extra term there that we already had um, kind of floating around anyways. It just amplified it a little bit. Okay, um, so we convert this back to the time domain. We're going to do the time warp again. And we end up with VC of T is equal to... 5ut minus 3, and then a nice little uh, exponential here, minus t over 10, times uh, ut as well. Okay. So that's it. We, we obtained the same solution here that we had, oops, that we had right here, and the same solution that we had right here, okay? So three different ways now that we've kind of solved the same problem. And as it turns out, again, the, this block diagram is gonna be useful to us just like it was for circuits because representing these phenomena in a physical model really helps us be able to build um, the math easier for ourselves, right? Because we have these handy equations that go along with them and we, and we know what these 
elements do once we've put them together correctly to model our system behavior. Okay, so that's pretty much it for that. Now, what if, what if I wanted to do the same thing, but I have a, con a conductor, an, in an inductor. If I had a conductor, I'd, I'd have a, an orchestra, right? Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. I'm losing. I'm trying to record two lectures in one day. I'm losing my mind. All right. So let's go ahead and write out our equations here. We rewrite our nice little handy equation for the... Um, let me pull this up here. Uh, where did I put it? Uh, this guy. Right, we're gonna actually rewrite this one from lecture 19 a little bit differently. So let me go ahead and snap that over here. This equation is the one we want. Okay, now let's go ahead and do the same tricks that we did last time. So we have VLS is equal to LSILS minus L, I, L, evaluated at zero. And recall that last time we defined here um, one over LS as the admittance and LS or SL as the impedance. So we'll do so here. VLS is equal to Z, L, I, L, S minus L, I, L at zero. And to create a companion equation, for this, we could rewrite it in terms of the, uh, in terms of the current in the frequency domain. We end up with the following: uh, we have V L S my uh, plus L I L at zero, and then divide all that through by uh, Z L. So we could write this in two different ways. Uh, we could either have um, ILS is equal to, you know, YL, if you wanted to do it that way. Um, what we're actually going to do is write it as VLS over ZL. And then recall that ZL is just LS, right? So when we do L over LS, we just have an S left over. So we have plus IL at zero over S, okay? And so these are the two equations that create our block model diagram for the uh, frequency domain equivalent of our inductor, where we had an impedance element and a source element, okay? So let's draw those two out based on the equations. So let's start with the this one first, okay? make our funny little doodle plus minus v c s currents coming in we have i l this time and then we're gonna run into z l and then minus plus l i l at zero notice here that this is reversed from before, right, with the signs, because we have a minus sign here, hence the minus plus. Okay, why is this in series? Well, recall that we're dealing with a voltage, right, so we're kind of dealing with a pseudo sort of a KVL equation in the frequency domain, though, so it's a little bit different. Um, but essentially, we have two kind of voltage drops to account for, one across here and one across here, right? There's there's a difference in potential, a potential difference in the frequency domain uh, that we need to account for with this equation. And so we have two elements that account for two different drops in that model. Okay, should come as no surprise what this is gonna look like. Honestly, if you can't figure that out by now, you might be in trouble. <laughs> But if not, we'll go ahead and draw it out for you. No worries. We won't pick on you too much. Okay, here we go. We have IL coming in. 
And again, we're taking a current equation and we're splitting it over two elements. And in this case, the current is additive, right? It's an additive current. So it's actually giving us a little bit of extra boost. Um, so we're going to let it be directed in the direction that we're going. That makes sense, right? Sure, why not? ZL goes here and our IL evaluated at zero over S goes here. Okay, so you can start to take a look at um, the homework in chapter 23. Some of the homeworks aren't quite aligned up nicely uh, with where they go in the, with respect to the lectures. So, you know, always be looking ahead a little bit and seeing if there's anything that you can approach. Um, I know there's definitely some parts of the problems that you can do already. Um, as this is Friday, yeah, whatever. But try to do some over the weekend and, and start to get a little bit of a head start as much as you can into those. Um, if I take a look here, you know, looking at stuff in the time domain convolution, you know how to do that. Laplace transform, you know how to do that. Okay. Well, and all we're talking about when we get to the uh, transfer function, this is just the Laplace version of H of T. Okay. This is a transfer function. So if you see anything with uh, that mentioned in it, that's what it is. It's pretty straightforward. This small signal stuff uh, we're going to talk about next time. Uh, it starts to get a little bit hairy. It's not that bad. We'll get through it. I know it's starting to look kind of crazy when we're going between domains and we got all this small signal stuff here. It's actually going to make it easier. Okay. Hopefully. Um, this kind of thing you should probably be able to do, I think. So you can probably handle that. Um, if you really want to get wild, um, you know, <laughs> go nuts with some switching circuits. We really do effectively have all the tools necessary at this point for you to be able to derive a lot of the information uh, that I'm going to be teaching you over the next couple of lectures, including the one that we did uh, now with today. Um, you really can do pretty much pretty much anything um, up until we start getting to more filtering stuff. And when we get to filters and the complete re uh, decomposition of the complete response, then things will get a little different. But, <laughs> but other than that, um, you know, you'll be good to go. Um, let's see, is there anything else to say? So this was chapter 22, right? So 23, transfer functions, yeah. Yeah, so next lecture is also going to be a little bit short. Um, these sections really could probably benefit from either being combined or um, maybe having some extra material in it. But uh, we'll we'll work some problems next time through the through the homework. So try to get a jump start on those, and uh, you know do as much as you can. Look through chapter twenty three, and and start working those. But yeah, otherwise we'll be working problems a little bit next time after we blast through uh, transfer transfer functions. All right, thanks a lot, guys. We'll uh, see you next time.